BBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. In this episode, I will be revisiting Jack Torrance as a Zodiac Killer suspect, responding to the debate on Planet X Filmworks, featuring Ray Grant, author of Zodiac Killer Solved, and Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com, and sharing some updates about the future of Black Box Online Radio. But first, I would like to say that today is Tuesday, strangely. Most of you guys know this show as Zodiac Monday, but yesterday was Christmas Day, so I decided to release the Zodiac Killer News Report for this week on a Tuesday. And... I want to begin with some new things about Jack Torrance as a Zodiac suspect. And I've been very critical of this person in the past. And by Jack Torrance, it has nothing to do with him specifically. It's all of the people who have been accusing him of being the Zodiac killer. The first one was an individual named Dennis Kaufman, who is the stepson of Jack Torrance. I should say was, because Dennis Kaufman has also passed away. And he got himself on national television talking about how he opened up a piece of electronic equipment and he found what he believes to be the Zodiac Killer's Lake Berryessa hood, the hood that was worn by the Zodiac Killer on September 27th of 1969 when he attacked Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard. Dennis Kaufman also claimed that he found a knife that had blood on it that could possibly have been used by the Zodiac Killer, maybe even in the Lake Berryessa attack. And he also said that he had pictures on film rolls that were photographs of the crime scenes. Now, that final one didn't amount to too much. It appeared that they were just photos of blurry images and no one was able to say anything conclusively about tying them to the Zodiac Killer. But Dennis Kaufman, again, he has passed on. He has left behind a legacy that has been picked up by other people. And some of them would be the handwriting expert Nanette Bartow, who looked at Jack Torrance's handwriting and determined that it was a match to the Zodiac Killer's letters. Harriet Sue Shea, the author of The World According to Jack Torrance, and I've called her Harriet Sucher in the past. Her name is spelled S-U-C-H-E-R, but I saw her on YouTube. She says her name is pronounced Sue Shea. And also, Stephen Dewhurst has a book out called The Demon of the Southwest Wind, which is about Jack Torrance as a Zodiac Killer suspect. So some people were persuaded by Dennis Kaufman and his revelations and accusations against his stepfather. But the reason why I'm sharing this info with you guys is I found that there is a YouTube channel called Finding the Zodiac that is run by Nanette Bartow, and that's the name of the channel. The name of the show that is on the channel is Hit the Road Jack Finding the Zodiac, talking all about Jack Torrance as a Zodiac killer suspect. And if you're curious about different perspectives on true crime cases, if you like to hear different perspectives on true crime cases, it might be something of interest to you, only if you're going to approach it with an open mind. And I can find a certain amount of value and appreciation for the channel because Annette Bartow seems like someone who is rather composed in her thinking. She's the host of that one, and sometimes she brings on people like Harriet Suchet, and she quotes Stephen Dewhurst's book a lot, but she, again, is coming at this from a a handwriting expert's standpoint, and then has found other supporting points that would agree with her theory. She is committed to the idea that Jack Torrance was the Zodiac Killer suspect. Now, if you're going to be rather dismissive of the initial premise, then it probably wouldn't be of something of interest to you. But the second reason I'm talking to you guys about this is I was watching their episodes, and I want to look at their profile that they've created about the reasons why they think Jack Torrance was the Zodiac Killer. The Zodiac was a serial killer that operated in California in 1968 and 69, and whatever happened before or after that is still part of the mystery. The Zodiac Killer also mailed in letters and cryptograms. These are the reasons why Nanette Bartow believes that Jack Torrance was the Zodiac Killer. Number one, uh, she is a handwriting document examiner and states that she believes Jack Torrance's handwriting matches the Zodiacs. And even though this sample that has been shared is going to be a little bit blurry on the screen right here, I do confess it looks similar. Number two, it's estimated that Jack Torrance was between 5 foot 10 and 5 foot 11, 5 feet 10 and a half inches tall maybe, 
and even I have said in a previous episode of Black Box Online Radio that I estimated that the Zodiac Killer most likely was 5 feet 10 and a half inches tall. Number two, a lot of people think that the Zodiac Killer had a military background, and some people even get more precise, like Michael Cole, author of the Zodiac Revisited Trilogy, who expected that the Zodiac was either ex-Navy or ex-Air Force. Jack Torrance was both ex-Navy and ex-Air Force, stationed in Japan for a while, and in the most recent episode of Finding the Zodiac that I was watching, Nanette Bartow was talking about how she uncovered something, um, again, from Stephen Dewhurst's book about how Jack Torrance tried to get into the Navy's top electronics school, and it appears that he was in there in the 1950s, and he failed out. That was the word that she used, failed. He failed out of the electronics school, and that was the reason why he then went to Japan with the military, but he was somebody who would have been very familiar with electronic systems, and throughout his life, he was a ham radio operator. He had multiple licenses to operate radios, and another piece of information that um, appears to clarify the situation is the piece of electronic equipment where Dennis Kaufman found the Lake Berryessa costume is said to have been the PA system that would have been used for a radio. You, when you uh, read about the story online, sometimes they say it's in an amplifier, sometimes they say it's in a piece of recording equipment. They wanted to um, clarify that this is the PA system for the ham radio. And of course, that's where the Lake Berryessa hood was found. And this is the absolute biggest reason why I wanted to talk about Jack Torrance on the Zodiac Killer News Report. I apologize because in the past I said that it looked like the symbol on Dennis Kaufman's Zodiac hood was drawn on. Other people have talked about this. They're like, no way, that's not the Zodiac Killer's costume. The Zodiac's hood had a white symbol. This one is clearly golden, and this is drawn on, and Brian Hartnell recalled very clearly that it was sewn on at Lake Berryessa. But Nanette Bartow did show some close-ups of the hooded costume found by Dennis Kaufman, and yes, it is sewn on. There is golden thread that is sewn into the black fabric. And then there's also the um, claims about how Jack Torrance would have been very familiar with codes because he was, again, ex-Navy and ex-Air Force, and also very familiar with um, geographic areas. This isn't so much Zodiac related, but some personal info that they share about Jack Torrance is that he was almost an expert on geography and topography, and he was just very familiar with the lakes and bodies of water in the country. And they said it like he would go in like airplanes, like small bush planes, and if they were flying around, he could just tell you that that's this lake, this is that pond, and he knew them all by names. And some people do think there is a bodies of water connection to the Zodiac Killer case. All right, now let's look at some challenges to this profile that they've created. I mean, overall, I have to say that it's better than I had given it credit for in the past. You have to give credit where credit is due. But some of my initial responses still stand to Jack Torrance as a Zodiac suspect. Let's look at the Lake Berryessa hood. Okay, I was wrong. I thought that that golden circle and cross had been drawn on. It was sewn on. But Brian Hartnell estimated that the cross was three inches by three inches. You can find this in the police report. And that's just an estimation from what he says looking at it but three by three, white, sewn with care and precision. And this one appears to be very rough, much larger than three by three. I mean, this is a very large circle and a very large cross, and it is golden, not white. And the explanation that was provided by Nanette Bartow was, there was one line that she shared from the police reports, uh, which is a statement that I haven't read, that Brian's actual words were that, it was white, but it appeared orange because of the glow from the setting sun. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were stabbed after 6 p.m. on September 27th of 1969, so the sun would be going down. Now, I find that to be a very, very weak explanation, because that just means that it's not orange, it's not golden. He says very clearly it's white. Go ahead, walk through the parking lot at a supermarket or a shopping center, wherever you go out again, whenever you go out again. And if you see a white car in the sunset, yeah, it might have an orange glow, but it's a white car. It's not actually orange. It's not actually gold-colored. So I think that that is a strike against 
the hooded costume found by Dennis Kaufman, and also the hooded costume that he has shown up appears to be very rough. It doesn't have the um, longer parts that would have gone over the shoulder, again, in my own est estimations, just looking at the uh, forensic illustration and the descriptions from Brian Hartnell. Now, that doesn't prove anything. It's just, I think that it is a very rough makeshift costume, not done with care or precision at all. Superficial analysis on my part, but I would share it all the same. And somebody once brought this to my attention, saying, okay, there's this profile, there are these pieces of evidence that support Jack Torrance being the Zodiac Killer. What if the hooded costume that Dennis Kaufman found wasn't actually the one worn at Lake Berryessa? What if um, Jack Torrance didn't commit the Lake Berryessa stabbing and he just hid the ho this fake hooded costume to make people think that he wasn't the Zodiac Killer? And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. You're saying this guy fabricated a Zodiac Killer hood? So people would think that he was not the Zodiac? No, 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 I don't think so. And I'm going to be as generous as I can, because I think a narrative that would make more sense would be that, oh, okay, that was an early prototype, that was something that he made once that he was planning on using, then he thought it wasn't good enough, so he just hid it away for later, and that, no, it wasn't the real costume that was worn at Lake Berryessa. But the show Finding the Zodiac expands. It goes way beyond the canonical Zodiac crimes, and it even goes beyond the Zodiac and true crime in general. Because Harriet Suchet was a guest on the program and was talking about the Zodiac killer's actions at Lake Berryessa. And one thing that he said was, he, ho he walks toward Brian Hartle and Cecilia Shepard. He's carrying a gun, which is most likely a forty-five caliber pistol, and he says... All I want is your money and your car keys. I'm just trying to get to Mexico. And what they said, this is from Harriet Suchet, is that Mexico is a hotbed of conspiracy theories involving the CIA. And in a different episode, Nanette Bartow says, one of the reasons why Jack Torrance may have failed out of the Naval Electronics School is they believe that he would have been a good candidate for CIA activities, particularly involving MK Ultra, that he was spotted by a higher up from the CIA and used for a different reason. And I'm like, whoa, now wait a second, wait a second. You guys were making sense for a second, and then all of a sudden you are jumping into the world of vast conspiracies. Like, whoa, whoa, you had some facts, and now you've just gone off the rails. Not only have you gone off the rails, you got lost in the forest. So I found that whenever there was contradictory evidence that was provided to their set of theories involving Jack Torrance and the Zodiac, they just started making up these very, very wild claims that are most likely false. I mean, and you got to do a lot better than just say, well, someone said the word Mexico, and yeah, there's all kinds of CIA involvement in Mexico. Well, guess what? There's also CIA involvement in California. There's also CIA involvement in Iran. I mean, in countless places around the world, so anybody can make those types of mental connections. And it's also very unsatisfying to hear that the reason... They think he failed out of electronics school is because he was spotted by somebody from the CIA. And they, the exact word that was used was maybe, maybe someone from the CIA did that. I'm like, well, wait a you guys are saying that you have identified the Zodiac Killer, and that's your explanation? Well, maybe from someone from the CIA was pulling the strings behind the scene. What do you mean, maybe? This isn't just some type of speculative arrangement of possibilities. You guys are saying you actually found the Zodiac, and that's your response. So ultimately, I have to say that even though I was too harsh and too critical of some of their claims in the past, I have to still disagree with most of the points about Jack Torrance as a Zodiac killer suspect. And again, it's nothing about the guy personally. These are other people who are accusing him of being the Zodiac and the Jack Torrance theories get bigger and bigger because one of the crimes that Nanette Barto accuses Jack Torrance of committing is the 1955 murder of Stephanie Bryan. And this was a case that I was not familiar with prior to watching her episode. 
I found that there was an episode about Stephanie Bryan on the YouTube channel True Crime TV. It's nice to see how that channel has evolved over the top, over the years. I haven't watched True Crime TV in quite a while, but Stephanie Bryan disappeared on April 28th of 1955, and there was a conviction in the case. This is another thing that really surprised me, and Nanette Bardo completely acknowledges this. A man named Burton Abbott was convicted for her murder because there is a big media firestorm after Stephanie Bryan goes missing, and Burton Abbott's own wife, Georgia Abbott, finds items in their home that belong to Stephanie Bryan. So the authorities get alerted, and then they are looking for Stephanie Bryan. And in a place called Weaverville, California, which is roughly a four-hour and 25-minute drive, according to Google Maps, from Burton Abbott's home, he had a cabin. And 339 feet from the cabin, they found the remains of Stephanie Bryan. And I'm like, whoa, 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 Zodiac Killer Connection, slow down, guys. This guy has her items in his house. Her body is found, again, 339 feet from his cabin. Now, I I know I've just watched two videos, and I read one article online from SFGate, but that's some pretty damning evidence. I think the only way that you could say that... Burton Abbott did not commit this murder is that he was framed, and that would mostly be the foundation of his defense. And he was actually executed for the crime, and even Annette Barto was discussing this, that this was one of the premier cases in California, as well as the United States during the 1950s, and even the mid part of the 20th century, where not only was there a murder conviction based on circumstantial evidence, but Someone received a death sentence, and the death sentence was carried out purely because of circumstantial evidence. And, I mean, even Annette Bartow was saying that, okay, I, it, most likely this guy was an active participant in some way, but that doesn't mean that Jack Torrance couldn't have been involved to a certain extent. But to me, again, when I saw those first two videos, plus reading one article, I was like, this looks like an abduction sexual assault, and someone transported her body to a different location because they thought that the four-hour drive would throw off the authorities. But where he got sloppy was he left the trophies behind, like he took items from her as trophies, and then that's what his wife found, which ultimately led to his downfall. Now, there is a book out there that was featured on True Crime TV called A Trail of Corn. Yes, A Trail of Corn, that looks at how Burton Abbott was indeed framed for the crime, and it explores his innocence. I'd like to read this description for you. It's written by Keith Walker. A book, A Trail of Corn. How could a man be guilty of kidnapping and killing a 14-year-old schoolgirl while he was on a fishing trip miles away when she disappeared? The district attorney claimed that the suspect was a vicious sex killer who stalked the victim and kept her possessions as a fetish. But Burton Abbott said he was 175 miles away when the young pretty girl, Stephanie Bryan, was last seen in Berkeley, California, at her home, and he had witnesses to prove it. Keith Walker's compelling story asks, did David Abbott, did Abbott, excuse me, it just says, did Abbott, did Abbott leave a trail of corn showing evidence of his implication as the district attorney claimed, or did someone else leave the trail of corn? Perhaps purposely, a phone call with only two minutes to spare, a mother's anguished cries, soil on boots, nine inches down in a grave, human fingers protruding from a trunk lid. These are some of the strange incidents and ingredients that went into this fascinating story. Burton Abbott was a tubercular ex-GI student at the University of California, Berkeley, when Stephanie disappeared on her way home from school on April 28th of 1955. Investigation showed that Abbott made a trip to the family cabin on the day that the girl disappeared. Later, Stephanie's remains were found in a grisly grave 339 feet up a steep hillside from the cabin. But Abbott flatly denied any implication in the girl's death. He said that he was the victim of a cruel hoax. A ruthless district attorney who based his case on suppositions and innuendos and a biased judge, the controversial case was one where almost everyone was divided on whether he committed the crime. There were only circumstantial pieces of evidence to implicate him. Puzzling twists in the story produced blazing headlines month after month in California newspapers. Keith Walker, a newspaper man at the time, spent 35 years researching and writing this book, A Trail of Corn. He has produced the powerful story of intrigue, suspense, drama, grief, conflict, and human emotions. He has used his reporter skills to get the full scope of this bizarre and compelling story. So, as far as these pieces of evidence, number one, did this um, guy 
actually go on a fishing trip and he was 175 miles away when the crime committed. Well, it seems like he has witnesses that support the story, but are they telling the truth? And here's another thing about the um, conv the execution that was rather bizarre. He was executed two weeks before his lawyer was um, supposed to appeal the case. So maybe in a different episode, we could say something about were his rights violated? Did he actually commit the crime? But for this episode here, I think that he's a much stronger suspect than Jack Torrance or the Zodiac Killer. But that's just my take on the subject. And feel free to put your ideas in the comments section down below. And if there are any other Zodiac Killer suspects that you would like discussed on the channel, or are there any other theories involving the Zodiac that you would um, want presented here, you can put your ideas in the comments section down below as well. You can send long longer thanks to me at blackboxonlineradio with AOL. Dot com. And right now, I would like to get to your supporter shoutouts. It's a page for Black Box Online Radio at buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shoutout on Zodiac Monday. And the first one comes to us from River Prawn Pottery. Thank you so much for your regular and consistent support. The second one comes to us from ABBA, who says, Great show. And then the next one is from Batman66, who says, Batman bought you a coffee, a present, and a Christmas tree. Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year to you, Batman66. Thank you so much. Our next one from buymeacoffee.com is from Classic Chevy Cat, who says, Ned, I'm overjoyed. You made my day announcing your engagement. I've been sick for nine days, and it is hanging on me like a cheap suit in a rainstorm. But when I heard you're getting married, I yelled, yes. Marriage is heaven with the right spouse. I know. God bless you and your fiancé. Have a Merry Christmas from Classic Chevy Cat, the hapless romantic. And Classic Chevy Cat, thank you so much for your regular and consistent support as well. Happy New Year to you. And the next one comes to us from Alden Tibbs, who says, Ned, I love the show. I've been interested in the Zodiac case since the early 2000s, and I appreciate all your content. Keep doing what you do. I appreciate it. And the next one is from James Cheney, who says, Merry Christmas, Ned. Hope you enjoy the book. Have a good New Year. Happy New Year to you, too, uh, James Cheney. And, yes, he donated a copy of Robert Graysmith's 1986 book to, to Black Box Online Radio, and I will be discussing that on some future episodes of the Zodiac Monday program. And that's ultimately what I wanted to talk to you guys about. Now, as classic Chevy Cat said, I am now engaged in here with my fiance in the Philippines. I know that most of you guys think of this show as coming to you from West Virginia. For the last several months I've been in the Philippines and my fiance and I decided to move here because of a business reason actually and not going to get into the details of that but a short-term business related issue that will be going until April and that means that for the year of 2024 I'm going to be a little bit busier and I wanted to record as much as I could for Black Box Online Radio when I had a little bit more free time. That's why I've been putting out more interviews, true crime interviews on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Zodiac interviews on Fridays, live streams on Thursdays. But because of my offline issues, for the year of 2024, I'm going to start out by releasing some episodes that I've already agreed to record with people. There are already some guests that are scheduled to be on the program. But then, Zodiac Monday is going to expand into a bigger program, and that is going to be one that is going to have my commentary, like I'm sharing with you in this episode, and then there will also be segments that will be featured, the interviews and the guests will be on Zodiac Monday, and then I'm going to do more things like I did in the past, like the AMA, responding to your questions and comments. Gibby Dunnison and ask me anything, a Q&A session, a mailbag, as some people call it. So all of these things will be on Zodiac Monday, and the episodes will be a little bit longer, but I can work on it whenever I have time and then release it every Monday for you guys. And if you'd like to see a preview of um, the Zodiac episodes with images on the screen and a guest, I invite you to check out my interview with Chad Burke, who is the author of Cracked, and he has also just released a new book called He Who Lives by the Code Dies by the Code, and I'll share something about that in just a second. But as far as the um, future episodes of Black Box Online Radio, I'm going to be releasing my audiobooks on the weekend, like chapters of my audiobooks. The next one will be Down the Dark Lane, Three Thrillers from the Motel, and 
soon there will be another sequel to Killer on a White Horse. Yes, the White Horse Killer saga. And I'm aiming to put those out on Fridays. And at least once a week, I will be doing a segment on buymeacoffee.com. The Christmas episode for this year came out on buymeacoffee.com and the podcast zone. Yes, they have this place called Posts, and they have a podcast zone where the audio can be uploaded directly. You don't have to pay any money at all to listen to it. It's 100% free. But that segment will be called The Zodiac Killer and True Crime Talk. And at least once a week, I'm going to be doing a segment over there that's going to be done in the tradition of True Crime Talk Radio. Every episode will include some things about the Zodiac Killer, but also about other true crime stories. I follow all types of true crime cases, and the best way to find all of those stories, if you're curious about them, is to follow BBOR's shorts that come out here. I, I try to release one YouTube short every day, and that's a big challenge, so sometimes it just comes out as four days a week or five days a week. But for the YouTube audience, please look out for Zodiac Monday, the audiobooks, and daily YouTube shorts. The shorts are also released on Facebook and Instagram in the Reels section. And when I say that I'm unable to put them out seven days a week, it is quite difficult to take a true crime story and condense it down into one minute, giving not only the facts but also commentary. And that will be another advantage of releasing Zodiac Monday and then focusing on the shorts, because then I can actually put some time into the creation of the scripts, and every YouTube short that I do, 99% of them anyway, are scripted. Whereas Zodiac Monday, I've always done it free-flowing, just talking to you guys about the Zodiac Killer. So the year 2024 will see some changes on the show, but I've been contacted by countless people who have requested who have been guests on the program and I'm going to try and bring people on. You can have any su suspect, you can have any theory, as long as I think the person is credible to a certain extent. And also, they're genuine believers in their work. And I just told you that I disagree with almost everything that Nanette Bartow has said about the Zodiac Killer and Jack Torrance being the Zodiac. I would gladly have her on the program, because I don't think she's a liar. I don't think she's a fraud or anything like that. We just have completely different interpretations of the evidence. And I, I've shared enough about her as well. Last week on the Friday episode, I released an interview with Eddie McNamara. He's the author of the novel Brooklyn Hardcore. But he wanted to talk about some letters that might have been written by the Zodiac Killer, or they could possibly be forgeries, hoax letters, un not authentic communications, and the specific person accused of these hoaxes was Dave Toskey. Tom Boyd of ZodiacKiller.com decided to write in the comments section calling out Eddie McNamara for a lot of the observations that he made about the Zodiac and saying that he's not a document examiner, he's not a professional in this field. And to Eddie's credit, in his defense, speaking on his behalf, he didn't say with certainty that Dave Toskey fabricated any Zodiac communication. Specifically, we're talking about the 1978 letter. That's the one that's in the forefront. But what Eddie wanted to say is that when he's reading these reports and the case file, he found three FBI memos that talk about the possibility of Dave Toskey fabricating the 1978 letter. And I asked him a direct question. How certain are you? Like, would you say you're completely certain, or do you think it's just very likely, or is... It's just a possibility. He said he thinks it's very likely that Dave Toskey, the detective, and he was played by Mark Ruffalo in the Zodiac film from 2007, he thinks it's very likely that Dave Toskey fabricated the 78 letter, but he doesn't say that he has some type of omniscient knowledge or he knows that to be a 100% fact. And as far as not being a professional document examiner, or as Tom Voigt also pointed out, not examining the documents firsthand. Eddie was simply sharing the observation that he read these FBI memos and he's giving his response to it. He's also partnered that with some other readings about the Zodiac Killer and other interpretations of the case, and he is giving his response to that. And the reason why I had Eddie McNamara on the show was one of you guys in the comments section requested 
to have him on to talk about the Zodiac Killer's um, possible hoaxed letters. And on Friday, I will be releasing part two of my interview with Eddie McNamara, and we will be talking about the Lake Herman Road murders. In this episode, I focused a lot on Lake Berryessa, where the Zodiac attacked Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, but the Zodiac's first crime was, of course, Lake Herman Road, the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. And this is one where the... Um, there is a very high chance, by high, I, mean, I shouldn't say that, there is a chance, there is a chance that this crime was actually committed by someone who was not the Zodiac, and the Zodiac only took credit for it. I used to really explore this possibility. Now, as of now, I state that there was one Zodiac killer responsible for the five murders attributed to him in the 1960s. That's the theory that I'm going with, but I'm always open to correction and new possibilities. And I've gone back and forth on other issues in the past, so please tune in for my interview with Eddie McNamara this Friday here on Black Box Online Radio, and please like and subscribe. Also visit buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88. As I said, that's another way you can support the channel, and just recommending new pieces of true crime material to be discussed on the program. So, I said I would talk about the debate that was on Planet X Filmworks featuring Ray Grant, author of Zodiac Killer Solved, and Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com. Now, this was a rather interesting debate because it was definitely a two-on-one show. Planet X Filmworks is hosted by Ross Geraci, and he has a lot of beef with Ray Grant, and it was Richard and Ross versus Ray, and I even was just saying, wait a second, everybody's name begins with R. Wish my name were Red instead of Ned, then I could join in and do a two-on-two there. And I know I've said some of this before, but I think with any debate on YouTube, a little bit more structure would be valuable. We're talking about something such as the first participant gets 10 minutes uninterrupted to make an opening statement. The second person gets 10 minutes uninterrupted to get an opening statement. I mean, they do this all the time on debate shows about other subjects. Then each person gets four minutes uninterrupted to respond to the opening and then you can jump into the free-for-all where it's just going back and forth. Because I find that, I mean, when I was watching this debate with Richard Grinnell and Ray Grant, I found that both of them know an enormous amount about the Zodiac Killer mystery, way more than I do. And Ray Grant knows so many facts about the Zodiac case, but when he's talking, he gets sidetracked very easily. He starts going off in the weeds, talking about an unrelated thing, and countless times the moderator, Ross Geraci, was trying to just pull him back. Okay, okay, we need to get back onto some things about the Zodiac, you know, going in directions about the Son of Sam or other true crime cases like the Unabomber. Granted, there are Zodiac connections in all of them. The Son of Zodiac by Jack Myers, the, um, Doug Oswell, Mark Hewitt books, talk about Ted Kaczynski as the Zodiac Killer. Every true crime case under the sun or in the darkness from the second half of the 20th century has some type of Zodiac Killer connection, either already in existence or waiting to be found. And look at what I said about the story of Stephanie Bryan. I mean, the Zodiac gets accused of murdering her, and I mean, I don't know about you guys, to go off in the weeds and on my own side out, I'm fascinated by this theory that this guy Burton Abbott didn't do it because of um, the trail of corn thing, like in the investigation that's been put into play. I mean, it have to be some type of frame-up job, but I'm going to redirect myself back to this. And I would like to look at a comment that came in on last week's episode from They Can't All Be Zodiac, who said that when it comes to a debate... Most people aren't even debating or discussing the facts of the case. They're just going in circles about their own assumptions. And my response is that disputing the facts is only one aspect of a debate. There are also discussions on the interpretations of the evidence. And that's what people really want to focus on. That's what I think the majority of the Zodiac Killer debate files has been, discussing the interpretations of the evidence. Now, they, they dispute the facts. They discuss the interpretation of the evidence and say that this is the theory that I think is correct. For example, Ray Grant, um, author of Zodiac Killer Solve, believes that there was a Zodiac Killer conceptual art project 
that was orchestrated by Berta Margulies, who incorporated three other participants, Hugh Penn, Gareth Penn, and her son, Michael O'Hare. And it was all done in a calculated way, leaving mathematical signatures. It was done to create a certain set of angles across the United States of America, going from California to Nevada to Massachusetts, and that this artist, Berta Margulies, planned the whole thing. Now, that's his theory. Richard Grinnell is also a great person to have on for a debate program because he has a lot of theories that relate to the Zodiac Killer's letters and unconfirmed communications. I think Richard Grinnell, more than anybody else, believes that there are an enormous amount of what we call unconfirmed Zodiac Killer communications that were actually written by the killer. And maybe this is a fair assessment of Richard Grinnell's theory that there was a single Zodiac killer who operated in 1968 and 69 who committed the Lake Herman Road murders, the Blue Rock Springs shooting, the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and the murder of Paul Stein, the taxi driver. Then, this person has already proven to California and the world that he was the Zodiac killer. He's left behind an enormous amount of evidence. He made phone calls, he wrote a message on the car door, he mailed in letters with a piece of Paul Stein's bloody shirt, multiple letters with pieces of Paul Stein's bloody shirt. He's proven to everyone's satisfaction that he is a real serial killer. Now he can focus his efforts and energies on the letters. And then he is just going to keep writing letters well into the 1980s. And there was one point in the debate discussed by Richard Grinnell and Ray Grant, and that related to how people in the online sleuthing communities approach the Zodiac Killer evidence. For example, some people will look at someone's photo and say, no, I don't think this person looks like the composite sketch. It can't be him. Or they will look at the handwriting samples and say, I don't think that looks like the Zodiac Killer's handwriting. It can't be his. And both Richard and Ray were in agreement that that type of method is impractical. Now, there was a little bit, talk, a little bit of talk about psychological profiling, like some people saying that this person doesn't seem to have the personality that would fit the Zodiac killer, and they didn't focus too much on that, but both of them also seemed that they were somewhat in agreement of, if we do not know who the Zodiac is, how can we be making psychological assessments of his personality? And I halfway agree with them, and I also halfway disagree with them, because the way that I approach this on Black Box Online Radio is, we have some facts that we have to explore. We do have the Zodiac Killer's handwriting. We have samples that have been attributed to confirmed communications from the Zodiac Killer. We do have the composite sketch, which again is just what the witnesses thought the Zodiac Killer looked like. And these are things that people can examine. And we can look at those as pieces of evidence, but then provide the conditions. And one of the biggest conditions is that a composite sketch is not what the killer actually looked like. It's what the witnesses thought he looked like. And Ray Grant was talking about the Golden State Killer, and he asked uh, the host, Ross, about what do you think of the different Z Golden State Killer composite sketches? How many of them looked like Joseph D'Angelo? Maybe one? And my take on that was, there were numerous composite sketches in the Golden State Killer case. There were three of them that were widely distributed, and I thought that each one of them captured one of his features very well. One of them captured the eyes very well. One of them captured the chin and the jawline very well, and so on. So, they're not going to be perfect. And let's just say, hypothetically, if the Zodiac Killer mystery were solved tomorrow, I think that the male who murdered Paul Stein, the white Caucasian male who murdered Paul Stein, would have some very strong similar or facial features to the Zodiac Killer's composite sketch, but would not be an exact match. And I know it's not exciting to hear that sometimes we have to meet in the middle. We have to find the parts that are working, find the parts that are not working, and just kind of throw out the ones that don't work and just meet in the middle ground. It's not going to solve the case, no, to just look at someone's handwriting and say, no, I don't think this matches the Zodiacs, can't be him. It's not going to solve the case to say, yeah, I think this person matches the composite sketch, maybe it's him. You cannot get definitive answers that way. I'm completely in agreement on that. But when we do look at the facts that have been presented to us, we can evaluate them. And it goes well beyond just the handwriting and the composite sketches and psychological profiling. What about the 
witness descriptions of height and weight and so on. Maybe if you have a suspect that's five feet four inches tall, probably not. What if you have a suspect that had a very big scar on his face that um, was there in 1969? Probably not. There could be certain factors that would mostly eliminate someone, even if not 100%, but for all intents and purposes, it could eliminate somebody as a suspect. So I do think that there's a fair amount of value in discussing things like handwriting samples, even though I'm not a trained document examiner. But we have somebody like Nanette Barto, who is a trained document examiner, and I think that at the end of the day, we're going to find out that her conclusions are incorrect. Michael Wachtel, as well, the author at the end of The Zodiac Killer Mystery, who talked about Earl Van Best as a Zodiac Killer suspect, I also think that his conclusions are going to be incorrect when we finally get answers, if and when we do. But I'm still not going to completely close uh, the book on trying to uh, analyze the facts that have been presented to us. If you want to dispute that, you can put your ideas in the comments section down below. I'd love to read them. And I would like to conclude with something from the book Homicide, The View from Inside the Yellow Tape by Cloyd Steiger. This is a book that I've been discussing with you guys from time to time on the Zodiac Killer News Reports. And Cloyd Steiger was a real-life homicide detective in Seattle. I've interviewed him on the show, not only talking about this book, but also about his book on the serial killer Gary Jean Grant. And one of the chapters in the book talks about the murder of a woman named Mildred Simmons. Mildred Simmons allowed a man to stay in her apartment temporarily from time to time and one day a dispute took place and he killed her and the description of the murder in the book homicide the view from inside the yellow tape is she had her throat slit and turned like a pez dispenser like someone pulled her head down very gruesome crime scene but then the killer sat in the apartment and drank a bottle of malt liquor maybe even two bottles after the murder and the line that Cloyd Steiger shares which I believe is an interpretive statement is the killer sat there admiring his work I just wanted to share this in conclusion that that is a type of behavior that frequently gets associated with serial killers like the previously mentioned Golden State Killer or like serial killers that are cold methodical and calculating and intelligent but in reality the murderer of Mildred Simmons was just some deadbeat who was trying to use her for free stuff. So it goes to show us that there are types of behaviors like this at all levels across the intelligence spectrum, across economic status, social status, that there are going to be murderers out there. With the Golden State Killer, he would commit his crimes and then sit on the back porch eating crackers and drinking beer. It's almost like I've taken over the castle. I think the murderer of Mildred Simmons did a very similar thing. He was caught because he um, was actually, he actually went to an apartment beneath hers, and they found the caps from the malt liquor bottles, as well as the bloody shoes had been hidden in a trash can, and he was easily caught and apprehended. This is just, um, goes to show that there are some sick and twisted people out there, and I mean, I think that these types of true crime stories just share the volume of how many sick and twisted people there are. But what do you guys think? You can share anything you want. And you can also send longer responses to me at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always BlackboxNed88 over on Instagram. And I'll see you over there. Goodbye.